Most UX designers make a huge mistake when it comes to their portfolios. And here it is. They show their work, but they don't tell people about their work. They don't provide that context. And without context, no one looking at your UX portfolio can get a sense of why you made the decisions you made and what they are looking at. And without that context, the reader, the user of your portfolio can't determine if your process and the path you were going down was a good direction to solve the problem that you were setting out to solve. So you cannot just show the screenshots. You have to talk about it. You have to explain it. You have to tell the story, as I'm sure you've heard many, many times. And if you don't tell the story and if you don't provide that context, then that's why you're probably not hearing back from recruiters or getting called back after that first phone interview because you weren't going deep enough and showing people that you can think like a designer. I am Sarah Duty, and I help UX people like you create stronger portfolios that really showcase your skills and your work so that you can be more confident about your portfolios. You can be equipped to present your projects in interviews and maybe even get hired. One of the things I hear from my audience is the, honestly, the anxiety they feel when they hear that they have to tell the story of their projects. They know this is what people interviewing them want to hear, but they don't know how to tell the story. And why is that? It's because you have been living and breathing this project for weeks, probably months, and you are stuck in the weeds of it. You are going into too much detail that the reader, the user of your portfolio does not need to know. So you have to keep it to the high level points. Don't go into the details and make sure you don't just rely on screenshots because a picture is not worth a thousand words. So I thought it would be helpful to jump over to my portfolio and show you one example of how I have gone through and told the story of one of my projects. So let's hop over to my portfolio now. Here we are in my portfolio. I choose to make it in Keynote so that I can tailor it to each person that I show it to. So we're not going to go through the whole thing, but I have my, you know, about me section, um, telling people what I do within user experience so they know I'm not the interface designer, I'm not the branding person, these are the things I do. Then I start to show some of my work. I choose to have kind of a table of contents to let people know what projects are coming up. But let's dive into this one, Kinpoint. So first off, I don't jump right into screenshots. I set up what Kinpoint is about. It's kind of like an introduction side, an executive summary, whatever you want to call it. But what we're doing here is we're telling people in a glance, what is Kinpoint? What makes it unique? And what did I do on the project? So it was a conceptual interactive prototype to help parents find and be reunited with their lost child at an amusement park. Kinpoint was unique because the child could not be wearing a, um, a tracking device, okay? And then my role was to lead really all of the product development. So understanding the product requirements with stakeholders, doing the storyboarding and creating that interactive prototype. But the point of this slide is in one click, quick read slash glance, let's be honest, people can get a gist of what the project is about. Then I dive in here and I choose to kind of have a little section on the left to let people know what my process is, to reiterate it, because as they're going through really quickly, I want them to remember they're on Kinpoint and they're on step X. So right off the bat for problem and process, I redefine the problem. Even though it was on the other slide, I want to make it crystal clear because chances are people probably did not read every word on the previous slide. So now, problem and process. 
in one quick sentence, just like your compass statement about you, you could call it your mission statement, whatever you want, this one sentence summary tells people what KinPoint is about. KinPoint was about creating an MVP prototype to help parents find and be right, reunited with their lost child at an amusement park. And the child couldn't wear a tracking device. And what I do next is I communicate a lot of things just from this visual below. I communicate it was a two week project and I communicate my process with these four thumbnails and a label for each of the steps. Notice I'm not just saying storyboard, personas, user flow, et cetera. In this process diagram, I'm telling people what's happening at each step. We're understanding the experience, we're empathizing with the user, et cetera, et cetera. But you can imagine how if I had tried to talk about this without visuals, it could have easily been four, five, six sentences long. No one's going to read that, let's be real. So the next, I launch into my storyboard. And again, I just don't have a slide that's the storyboard because, whoops, because I want to show people and tell them what they're looking at. So I say, a storyboard helps us identify key moments in the experience of a child going missing and being found at an amusement park. So there we go. I created a storyboard and what does it do? It helps us identify the key moments so we can understand the end to end experience. And what am I doing below? Again, I easily could have just put the entire storyboard, but I'm choosing to provide context and describe what's happening at each step so that if someone can't read or decipher my little drawings, they can get a gist of what's going on in each little one of my squares of my storyboard, right? So starting from the left, we're enjoying the day. Oh no, the child goes missing. Other park goers get an alert. Someone spots the child, they see the lost child. And then, oh, very far at the right, they're getting reunited. It's a little sloppy, but that's the point of that. And that's why I have the text to communicate in case my drawing, let's face it, isn't the greatest. Then what do we do next in this story of the project? Well, so the storyboard helped us establish this really shared vision with the stakeholders of the project so that everyone understood the big picture. But the storyboard also helped reveal some issues and also the key screens that the product might have. So again, I'm telling people a little bit deeper into my process so that they understand how the storyboard fed into the next things I did. So on the left here, issues, we identified it issues, um, things like, uh, is there Wi-Fi or would, do we need to rely on cell data? How will people find out about this app? All these questions that just, as I'm drawing, as I was drawing out these storyboard images, these questions were popping into my head and those are the issues. And then over at the right, I also, from the storyboard, was able to identify a bunch of key screens that might be a part of the product. I don't know if they are, because I haven't made it yet, but based on my storyboard, if you go back, you can see I've allowed the product, the app, to be in some of these little story blocks, not in huge detail. This one right here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but one, two, three. The fourth one at the right, where it says someone spots the child, there is an iPhone drawing there, and it says found. I'm not worrying about all the details of what's happening on that screen, but through doing the storyboard, I was able to start identifying the screens that would need to exist for that story to play out. Makes sense? So the storyboard helped establish this shared vision with stakeholders and revealed issues and key screens really early in that product development process. And then what happened next? Well, next, based on the storyboard, we identified the three main participants in the story or users in the story, actors, whatever you want to call them. And then I say, we use proto personas to help us stay anchored on the users and avoid letting our desire for features trump the user's needs. 
So I could have just said, next I made personas. Well, that's nice, but in saying what I have put on this slide, we use the proto personas to help us stay anchored on the users and avoid letting our desire for features trump users' needs. That just shows, again, my, I hope, maturity as a designer and also is educating people that, yes, we did personas, but we did proto personas, so we weren't going and doing interviews with people. We were doing this based on our collective knowledge and um, ideas about who these people are. And then on this slide as well, as you can see, I'm introducing these personas. I am not taking a slide from some other presentation and screenshotting it and putting like a detailed persona here and shrinking it down. That would be terrible and no one would be able to read that. So step one or slide one here is telling people, yes, we made personas based on the storyboard. Here are our people. And now for each proto persona, we identified the key tasks as well as their emotional state at each stage of the journey. And again, notice I have not just taken a screenshot or the literal persona document, whatever format that may have been, and like shrinking it down for this page, I have like done this in Keynote. I, whoops, my Keynote's freezing, but um, whoops, I really built this out, if that makes sense. So don't just go screenshot slides. There we go. I'm just trying to show you that, you know, I customized the look of the persona slide based uh, so that it would look really good in my portfolio, makes sense? So I'm showing, I'm only showing one, I'm showing the parents and I'm putting all the needs they need to accomplish, like they need to report their child is missing, provide details about the child, understand um, what's happening at each step. I missed some text there, but you get the idea. Needs to feel, they need to feel not overwhelmed, calm and reassured. And then other considerations, um, should they interact with a park official? Would they register their child in advance? Or how does a child ever like get into the app? Notice I'm not saying like the Brown family is 25 to 35 years old and has two children. They drive a Subaru and have a dog. Like that's not relevant to this. It's kind of a weak persona. To me, it's more valuable to be looking at what do these people need to do? What are the tasks they need to do? What are they feeling? What other special considerations should we be thinking about? So moving on, because I want to move quickly. Flows. So next we dive into mapping out this experience beyond the storyboard. So user flows for each key moment helped us identify key actions within the app and the screens to focus on first. So I'm showing my sketch. It's messy, but it's legible enough. And notice what else I'm doing. I'm providing context so that, oh, wow, those people, those personas I introduced a couple of slides back, look at, they're here right now. So now this is starting to make more sense to the reader or viewer or user who is looking at this for the first time. It's obvious to you, the person who made this user flow, but to the person looking at it for the first time, I believe little details like this are going to help convey the story and your process a lot clearer. So someone looking at this can be like, oh, there's those people, there's the parents, there's that other person at the amusement park. And so they can follow along and suddenly this user flow starts to make a little more sense. Or at minimum, they can see that I am integrating these personas into my process and not just like letting them die on Dropbox somewhere. So then moving on, we show the progression from my little sketches to now, oh look, a screen flow where we've got these detailed screens, really low fidelity wireframes here. And we are again providing the context of the people the parents and the person who finds the missing child. And if you really wanted to, you could 
you know, follow this along. But to the reader, to the user of the portfolio, they're seeing my process. They're seeing all this, each step start to build upon the other. And that's what we want. Finally, now we get to the prototype. It should be highlighted down here. Just pretend it is. But um, then we say, High Fidelity Screens established a realistic experience to encourage useful stakeholder feedback. Interesting, right? It's not just, imagine if this slide was just, you know, no text, just those screenshots. Okay, that's nice, but now I can understand, okay, obviously they're high fidelity screens, but oh, they were useful because it helped us get better feedback from the stakeholders. Again, showing a little bit more maturity as a, a designer, letting us understand one of the reasons why you decided to make these more higher fidelity screens. Maybe I was also going to do usability testing. That would be another thing I could have mentioned. And again, I'm sure you noticed, but at the bottom, providing that context of the users, of the personas, so that again, for the person looking at this for the first time, they're not totally lost as to what they're, they're looking at. And if they read, they could understand, okay, that first screen, the parents are reporting their child is missing. In the middle, that's where someone else at the amusement park receives an alert. And then on the right, that's where the parents might be able to add more details about the missing child. And then finally, we see it all come together where we go even deeper into one of the screens and telling people a little bit more about our design decisions. So I'm choosing to go very deep into the detail screen for the missing child. And I use, well, let's start at the left. So I have, you know, what it looks like in the iPhone, but then going over to the right, I have what's happening on the photos tab, and then I have what's happening on the details tab. And I'm educating the reader of my portfolio even more with these annotations so that they're not just staring at these screenshots and thinking, oh, that kid has a cute smile. They're thinking, okay, point number one, photos. Photos provided visual uh, for easy identification of the child. Oh, cool, okay, now I understand why photos are in there. Number two, the map. The map established context of where the child might be. So it's showing where the child was last seen and the little blue dot obviously means like our current location through GPS. Point three, this persistent I found the child button goes, you know, pretty self-explanatory, but I want to call it out. And then four, the details tab where the parents can provide more details. Maybe, you know, uh, if they have a medical condition or their age or a nickname the child might have or something like that. or you know, they're scared of uh, some Disney character, I don't know. But you can see this is educating the reader, educating the user of my portfolio. A little bit more about one, the product, but two, educating them about my ability as a designer to communicate what's going on in my product, communicate the decisions behind my designs. And if you fail to tell the story, if you fail to provide the context, then you know what's going through the mind of the people looking at your portfolio. There's like giant yellow flags for them and they're thinking, is this what this candidate would present in a client meeting to their peers, to the rest of the department? Because part of being a great designer is being able to communicate your designs and your design process. And so if your portfolio is just a bunch of screenshots and no explanation of the why, then the person looking at your portfolio, the recruiter or the hiring manager, is going to be very nervous and frankly skeptical that maybe you cannot communicate your design decisions and articulate those. So do this, I want you to do this. I want you to go to your own portfolio and go through one of your projects and think to yourself, if someone were scrolling through this, 
Am I only showing just screenshots or am I providing the context? And if you are providing context, are you providing way too much detail? Do you have paragraph of text all over? Or are you just hitting the high points, just communicating the decisions that really mattered for some of the key parts of your product? And another rule of thumb would be, if someone only read the headlines, could they get the gist of your process? Because let's face it, we know people are not spending five, 10 minutes on the project like we just did. So if someone just read the headlines, just go with me here, create an MVP product, help parents get pre reunited. Okay, storyboard helps us identify the key moments and the experience, child going missing and being found. Oh, that's nice. The storyboard established a shared vision with stakeholders. Wow, that's really helpful. Based on the storyboard, we identified some participants. Oh, that's nice, okay. Okay, they did proto personas, that's wonderful. User flows helped each uh, identify the key actions within the app and the screens. Oh, that's good. Okay, now we're seeing it come to life. High fidelity screens established a realistic experience to encourage useful stakeholder feedback. Oh, that's a good strategy. See, that's what's going through the head of people looking at your portfolio. So imagine they're only reading your headlines and glancing at your images and they are not reading all the text. So guys, I hope this was really helpful for you and your portfolio. And if you want to learn even more, then I really encourage you to grab a free copy of my UX portfolio blueprint. It's linked in the description below and it's gonna walk you through eight steps you need to go through to create a really solid portfolio, including a portfolio that has context and not just screenshots. And if you wanna hang out with me and thousands of other UX people who are serious and laser focused on their portfolios and their careers, then I encourage you to come check out my Facebook group, the UX Portfolio and Career Tribe. And you can come in there and participate in Facebook Lives with me and things like that. It is also in the description below. Finally, if you enjoyed this, if you thought it was helpful, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, and definitely subscribe so you will not miss any more of the videos that I'm making for you to help you create a portfolio that really stands out and showcases your skills and tells that story. So I'll see you later. Thanks for watching.